Good evening, everybody. Let's see if this is working. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, and if you can take your seats now, we will be getting started momentarily. Welcome to Civic Hall. Welcome to New America NYC's uh, event this evening. I'm, I'm really excited for the, the conversation to come. My name is Lisa Guernsey, and I'm the Deputy Director for Education Policy at New America. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce you to what New America is all about, for those of you who may not know, although I believe there's many folks here who have been to New America NYC events um, in the past, and they know what kind of um, vibrant conversations take place in this room, so we're thrilled you're back with us tonight. The, um, so New America is based in Washington, D.C., but we are a think tank that's very different than other think tanks that may be much more focused on the federal policy and an ivory tower inside the beltway of Washington, D.C. We are trying to do what our president, Anne Marie Slaughter, calls rethinking the think tank. We are working very hard to make sure that we are getting out into communities on the ground and understanding better what today's families, students, teachers, anybody who's in uh, the sort of social space, what they're experiencing. We have um, our New York uh, base here. We also have uh, the Fellows Program in California and some bases in California will be opening up a Chicago hub sh very shortly. And then we also have a, a DC-focused um, uh, New America that is focused on what's happening in the neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., which is also a very different way for a Washington, D.C. think tank to think. Um, in our education policy program, we are also working very hard to make sure we're really understanding what's happening in this 21st century world that families um, and students are living in. And we have programs that reach from birth all the way through college, career, and workforce. Our early and elementary education policy program is run by Laura Bornfriend, and she unfortunately cannot be here tonight um, because of illness, but um, she has been running a, a program there that focuses not only on pre-K, but also on what comes before pre-K and what comes after in the K-3 years. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that this evening. And we have a dual language learners national work group run by Connor Williams. And it focuses on children who are coming to schools with a language other than English and are learning both languages at the same time. And we are really promoting policies to help foster both those languages and their development as children grow, grow up and thrive in school. And then there's many, many other programs as well. We invite you to, to check them out. Um, and I want to turn now our attention to this evening's uh, program, which is going to be, I think, a really fascinating conversation about equity, race, and how much our, our education system, especially for kids in their first 10 years of life, may not be helping all children, what we need to do to change it. So I just want to take a moment to introduce the amazing uh, star cast that we have that will be giving um, us our conversation tonight. And then they're going to come up and we'll start right in on the, on the program. So with us is Dana Goldstein, who um, also is uh, in the New America family. She's a former New America fellow and, as many of you know, is the author of the book The Teacher Wars, um, which if you haven't read or dipped your toes into, please do. It's really an amazing history that starts back over 200 years and really understanding what's called, uh, what she calls in her subtitle, the most embattled profession. And we also have with us tonight Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine and who I first came across when I was in my car listening to This American Life about a year and a half ago and uh, heard her amazing piece on um, Missouri school system, or a district in Missouri that was coping with um, issues of segregation, resegregation, integration in some really interesting ways. I'm really thrilled that uh, Nicole is a fellow now at New America with us. And then lastly, but also one of the reasons that we're all together tonight, I'm thrilled to introduce Ruby Takanishi, who is um, a fellow with the Education Policy Program at New America. And many of you may know Ruby because she's been in the world of education and child development and research for many, many years. She is a giant in this area. 
She was the president of the Foundation for Child Development, and before that was at the Carnegie Corporation, and has written a book that you'll see out there tonight, and I hope you have a chance to take a look and buy a copy. The title is First Things First, Creating the New American Primary School. And Ruby's argument is really interesting, complete kind of retake on what our elementary schools, our primary schools should be, and how they should be set up. So I think uh, you'll agree it's gonna be a very interesting conversation tonight. And so with that, thanks again to everyone for being here. And I will turn the, uh, the mic over to my colleagues. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much to Lisa, to Civic Hall, to New America, to Ruby and to Nicole for being here. Uh, we'll do maybe 40, 50 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. So think about those questions as we talk. Um, I wanna begin by reading a passage from Ruby's great book. Um, it comes toward the end, but I hope you don't mind uh, me reading it here at the beginning. It says, the stubborn flat line of education achievement since the 1970s leads to a clear conclusion. The American primary school deserves our urgent attention now. However, everywhere we look, we see that the American public is primarily concerned about the education of their own children, but not the children of others. One telling indicator of this disinterest is the number of store shelves devoted to books about raising one's own children versus those related to public education issues. How to engage the public to care for the future of other people's children our joint future on which the quality of life in our communities and nation depends will be increasingly challenging given the demographics of the child population and the fact that children below the age of 18 living in families are now less than 20% of all households. So I thought this passage really resonated with me. Another thing I was thinking about about how the demographics of young children especially differ from the overall demographics of the nation is that they're more likely to be children of color and they're more likely to be poor. So one of the things you do really well in the book, Ruby, is talk about how we have failed to have a national consensus around giving these kids what they need. And I'm curious if you could start us out today by talking about why, in your view, has that failure persisted through the generations as our peer nations have decided to invest in national systems for early childhood. Great question and a big question, and I actually wrote some notes about that before I came to make sure that I could use my uh, th to make sure that I would say something about it. Um, you know, I read uh, Nicole's article uh, the, in the New York Times Magazine um, this morning, and I was really taken by the last paragraph um, of, of that article because it basically, I think, um, <clears throat> says. Uh, some of the things that you just read. Um, first of all, I think what we have in the United States is um, an educational system that reflects, I think, our political philosophy and ideology and cultural values. And we have come to a place now um, that where um, it's basically we care for our own children. and. Most of us in this room, including myself, um, have children who are either doing very well and will continue to do very well, but the vast majority of children will not. And so the question, and, and here I again refer to Nicole's concluding paragraph in her, her article, do we care about all our children? Do we care about other people's children? And this is a, the, I don't have a particular answer, but I think I know that we have to try to address this for this, these questions for this particular reason. Even though our children grow up and will do very well or are doing very well, they have to live in a society where other people's children have not or are not doing very well. And I would say that the whole quality of our lives is um, diminished by this basic fact that the majority of American children are not doing very well. So 
what I would say is we have to be a better people. We will have to be a better country to address these issues. I think in answer to the question that Dana raised, I, I believe that at least up until now, and America is a very young country, um, the values of the private lives of families, um, certainly until kids go to compulsory education, and the emphasis on American individualism um, are extremely strong. And it's basically, you know, I still remember in 1993, uh, talking to an elected congressman from, uh, from Louisiana who, um, and this was after, um, in, in the Clinton, for Bill Clinton's administration, um, the, the um, House had turned Democratic. It was already, uh, so it was a, a major turning point. And we were talking about these issues and he said to me, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. This is 1993, and I think that, you know, that was over 20 years ago. I think we've come further along in, in the society, and we are now faced with the questions that Nicole raised and that Dana read from my book. How do we get to a place where Americans care for every child, not only our own children? So, Nicole, the, the same question. I know you're writing and researching about history right now. In your view, when you look at other nations, they do have comprehensive national systems for children, from often from birth. We completely lack that, and then feed them into a highly unequal school system. Where is the disconnect, do you think, in American history that leads to us being exceptional in this unfortunate way? I mean... I'm assuming you know what my answer is going to be. Um, I mean, we're exceptional because we have to deal with race in this country. And you can look at um, other nationalized things such as healthcare. And when you ask why does America not have universal healthcare and other countries do, it's because race. Um, we, when, you, when we have created a system built on racial caste and with the understanding that certain children are not worthy or deserving of getting the same education or that certain people are getting something that they don't deserve, then you are very unwilling to create something that will be national because then those people who you find to be undeserving will benefit from that. And it's very clear um, in just me beginning to read about the history of public schools in this country that the notion of schooling for children who were considered white and children who were considered black was very different. And it was an education that was to educate children into their lot in life. And for black Americans, it was to be the laborers and not to be able to compete with um, white Americans. So I think when you look at today, you're still seeing that those same ramifications. When I, when I talk to people all the time, I say, do we really believe that black and Latino children are just as smart as white children? We say it, but do we really believe it? Do we really believe that those children are as deserving of the best um, and the same thing that types of education that we provide for white children? I don't think we actually do. And if we have, then we sure don't do a very good job of showing that. Mm -hmm. And then one thing I've thought a lot about is if you look at Head Start, which is our single national preschool program, it is targeted toward the poorest of poor children, and so therefore it ha is a segregationist program by design, and, and that's one of the reasons why it potentially, maybe my theory, one of the reasons why it's somewhat popular, although still under attack for funding cuts constantly, but it doesn't require um, you know, upper middle class parents to send their kids to school alongside the poor, which as we all know remains controversial. I wanted to get to the question, uh, the policy question of universality versus targeted investments in the neediest kids, because I think this is one of the, I have found in my reporting, one of the biggest points of contention in the early childhood policy community. And let's use New York City as an example. Mayor de Blasio's UPK program, Universal Pre-K, is open to every single child in the city, and it's open to you even if you are a hedge fund billionaire, your kid can go for free. Now you could use another model where it was potentially a sliding scale program. Um, 
So I'm interested, Ruby, I know you're a proponent of universality. Why do you think that model works? And then I'll have Nicole discuss what she thinks some of the implications of universality are for getting kids of different backgrounds in the classroom together. Okay, um, I think the argument for um, universal access to hopefully um, high quality uh, pre-kindergarten for all children um, is based on, first of all, um, the fact that the United States, um, if you rank the United States globally in terms of the provision of early education or pre-K services, we're really in the bottom half. I mean, that's shocking, isn't it? But we're, we're really in the bottom half. So when you think about um, our global econ um, competition, for example, um, we, we are not educating our children, um, let's say, as early as many of our competitor and friendly nations are doing so. Um, so we need to change that. Um, the second is that it's, it's what shall I say, um, um, firmly established uh, based on large data sets um, and analyses that the inequalities among children in the United States, uh, given some of the things that we've talked about in terms of social policy, um, um, start very early in life, even before the age of two. And so we, we are a country that I think still believes in equality or certainly aspires to um, equality. So start having that inequality start so early in life is, is something that we need to address. Um, the third thing which I try to use um, uh, as an argument in my book is that we now have the research knowledge about how children develop from birth on that really is amazing in terms of their capacity to learn and to develop and, and to really flourish. And for many children not to have those opportunities so early in life, I think is a major contributor to inequality in, in American life. And then I say finally, in terms of access to um, pre-kindergarten pre and early education, since in the United States, um, that access is still a private good in most states. There are a few states that have universal pre-K. But um, since it's so highly dependent on private family resources, um, there are many children who have no access whatsoever to, to those programs and the benefits of those programs. So what I finally argue in my book is that due to all of these facts, if you will, um, the lack of access, the lack of access to quality programs, the research that we have about the ability of children to learn, they're not blank slates when they're, when they're born and so forth. Um, I, I try to make the argument that all children's access to, um, to pre-K education, starting at three if not, and certainly no later than four, is a basic human right and a civil right in the United States. And the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which I think are two years old now, um, do consider access to what they call pre-primary education uh, to be a universal human right. So for all of those reasons, I think there's a very strong argument that we should have all children participate in pre-K education starting no later than four and preferably at the age of three. But of course, given a situation of scarce resources, which we're always in in the United States with, with taxes, the, the counter argument is made, okay, half of kids are not currently in pre-K, let's go get that half. The other half, hey, their parents have somehow figured it out. So let's go ahead and let those families continue to figure it out on their own. So what is, in your view, the, for both of you, the argument in favor of subsidizing even those who are currently able to pay for early education privately? I would say it's a basic in income distribution of the United States. Um, the median family income in the United States is probably around 50,000. If the cost of pre-K education is anywhere from 
maybe a low of 12 to 20,000, you can sort of see how a family of four, with two children is not going to be able to afford private resources, private family resources for these programs. Um, that is a very large majority of American families. And certainly for low-income families, um, there is no possibility whatsoever. So uh, it, it's very clear that participation in pre-K programs is really very highly related to the incomes of their families. And it's pretty much common sense. If you don't have the income, you can't spend it. So I think, I mean, basically what you're asking is, should we be subsidizing free um, pre-K for the wealthy who can afford to pay for it on their own? Um, I think I think if you look at, for instance, a city like New York, or you look at public schools in general, that's what public schools do, is it doesn't matter what your income, we're all bringing children into the same classrooms ostensibly. Uh, in New York, I think, it could have been an opportunity for um, great integration because parents' fears um, with three and four-year-olds are very different than their fears with older children. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out that way. So what we found in New York is that um, pre-K is just as segregated and in some ways more segregated than the upper grades in schools. Um, and I think the, the belief that you would draw white parents into integrated schools if you start with pre-K just has not borne out. People are still sending their children to highly segregated um, preschools. And I think that um, what they're seeing is that black and Latino children are not getting necessarily the high quality pre-K either. So I think it's, it's, it's as all things in America is, you know, in, in the ideal way, there could be something for equity. Pre-K could be where you're starting to bring children who are not interacting with each other, different races, different classes together in the classroom, but on the ground, it's not happening. And in many ways, it's just recreating the privilege that those children are already going to get. And of course, we also know that all student achievement rises due to being in a racially diverse environment, and that's whether you're in the majority group or the minority group, that exposure to other types of people helps all children succeed. Another thing I'd, I would just bring up about the New York program is one of the ways in which it has continued to segregate students is so many of the programs, I believe more than half of the sites are not actually affiliated with a school they're through these community-based organizations, and those are often tuition-charging organizations for two-year-olds and three-year-olds, and if you have your child enrolled in that, say for $26,000 a year, like one I visited and wrote about, you're automatically in for the, for the free pre-K at that same site at age four, and they are allowed in their lottery to favor their own population. So this is a simple way that the sort of selection criteria for placing kids in schools in New York City is kind of leading to some inequalities. Of course, there are some really excellent programs in the UPK, like in places like Brownsville and East New York that are totally segregated. So, But I think like that's so typical of the Faustian bargains that we are constantly making in order to get something like universal, the money for universal pre-K, right? To pass a tax, to pay for it. Then you're, then you're making promises to the elite in order to do that. And I think we see that all the time. Um, clearly, when you think about universal pre-K, I don't think anyone, well, some people clearly are. I think a lot of people are assuming that it's going to be in a public school and that you are not paying for someone's private school tuition for pre-K. And I don't, I think that actually flies in the face of what universal pre-K is supposed to be. Um, that is not the common school's um, message, but in a place like New York, I think a lot of times, again, this is a progressive city that is willing to do a lot of things that maintain inequality. Yeah, and to bring Ruby's book into this, I mean, here in New York, we have the constraint of real estate. Like, Real estate drives so much in this city, and it's true in our UPK system. We don't have the space in the public schools. So I would want Ruby to address... Um, some yes, public schools. and some public schools. I want um, Ruby to address this because you make a really strong case that really convinced me to conceiving of early childhood education as something that begins at age three and goes all the way through the third grade. How can this be done when constraints like space, mean that so often that these programs for the youngest learners are just not gonna be you know, managed by the same folks at the same sites as elementary education. Right, and I mean, I think that um, 
you know, Nicole is right that except in very selected places, um, for example, the District of Columbia or the state of Oklahoma and so forth, where um, most of the um, universal pre-K provisions are in the public schools, um, in most of the states, um, for example, New Jersey and certainly in New York City, um, the role of the public schools is, is rather small. Um, and so it's really, most of the pre-K programs are in community-based centers and, and um, certainly not, not in the um, public schools. Um, I, I think that we, we have to think of, I, I think, a period of transition um, when we think about pre-K. Um, first of all, um, at the turn of the 20th century, um, there wasn't a, a, an American high school. And Ted Sizer actually um, uh, wrote his dissertation on the American high school, um, which I found really very interesting. So the American high school, um, before the turn of the 20th century, was like pre-K now, uh, was, was delivered in a whole bunch of non-public settings, typically all non-public settings. Um, and then there was a policy change that, that, you know, that high school, because of what we needed in industrial society and so forth, um, would, would um, have to be a, a public um, high school. And so over time what happened was that um, most of the kids went to public high schools and those children of the elite who had always gone to boarding schools and to private schools and so forth uh, continued to do that. And I see a very similar scenario that could occur um, in pre-K. So universal, I, I should also say throughout the world when it's provided, is not compulsory. It, it is complete, even in France, for example, where it's 100% participation rates and so forth. Um, it is not compulsory in any country of the world and it shouldn't be compulsory in the United States. Um, so what will happen is that most of the families will, for economic reasons as well as other reasons, send their children to publicly funded pre-K. Those families, for religious reasons or because they have resources to pay for um, uh, private uh, pre-K programs, will continue to do so. And families who want to raise their children at home will continue to do so. But I think that the vast majority of families and children who ha now have no choice in American society to participate in these programs will be able to have access to these programs. And um, again, you know, I just look at the income distribution in American society, and what we have is for those poor children who um, are able to participate in the um, targeted means-tested programs, they're able to do, do so. And I believe only 41% now of uh, income-eligible children um, participate in Head Start. Um, this is 50 years after its inception. Um, and so there are um, another 49% of, of children of, of at the poverty line, and all of the families between the poverty line and the median family income in the United States who really would have an impossible struggle to, to have any kind of access or participation to these programs. And so I think that it's really important to be able to have public provision and public support um, of their children's participation in these programs. Um, which is entirely voluntary. One of, the, um, one of the things you write about compellingly in the book is the ways in which we now know more about the best ways to teach young children to learn. And you also talk about the professional ethos of elementary education, which has differed from early childhood education. Um, to kind of paint with a broad brush for our, the purposes of our discussion, in the early childhood workforce, there's a big focus on social emotional learning of children and sort of the whole child and family engagement's really important. And especially, I think, since No Child Left Behind, what we're seeing more and more in the elementary grades, certainly when you get up to, say, third grade, is much more seeing schools as, um, I sometimes use the word achievement factories, <laughs> like the outcome is 
the academic achievement. That's what you're looking for. Hopefully it's measurable. You get the test score, it's going up, student growth, all of this. So when we think about sort of combining these two systems into one, as you propose in the book, making pre-K much more contiguous with K through third, what do you see as the risks of that sort of um, narrow focus on achievement being pushed down to the youngest children? And I'll ask Nicole to reflect on this too because when we think about equity, so often the schools that are most under pressure um, to raise those test scores are the ones serving our low-income children of color. Um, if you have any concerns about sort of this achievement focus being kind of pushed down to younger kids, like your daughter, for example, who's in this age group. Right. Um, I mean, I, I write about this a little bit in the, in the piece I did on my daughter's school, and as someone who's covered public education for more than a decade, um, I think one of the saddest things that, that came out of high stakes testing is the way that it takes joy and joy of learning out of schools, particularly schools serving um, black and Latino children and who are often very low income. Um, so all of those things that white middle class parents want for those children, all of those things that we remember about school as making young children want to come to school are stripped away at these schools. and. Um, I think that was one of the things that was so beautiful about my daughter's school was a school that was serving housing projects that was was refusing even with low test scores to take those things away. And I, I remember I was in, um, I was going to an assembly at my daughter's school and I'm watching all the little kids come in and they're so happy and, and joyful to be there. And I got really emotional because I knew what the road looked like down, you know, a few years from now when they begin to hate school, not because they don't want to learn, which is kind of the common narrative, but because school has become so constricted for them that it has become all about the test and, and um, achievement. I, I remember I would cover schools where there was no art, there was no recess, um, there was no music because every, and even something, um, like you couldn't teach history because history had to be about teaching literacy and I understood that because if you don't under you know if you can't read you can't do any of the other subjects but it would then mean that all day all kids were getting was being taught to this test and feeling like they were being punished and and so I think that that has been very harmful and I think we think that's okay for um low-income students and for black and Latino kids because we feel like they need to score better on the test. But this is not anything that would be acceptable for people who have choice and who have options for their own children. So I think, it, I think it's been really devastating. I think it turns um, children who have a great joy for learning, which is natural in children, even though that's not the narrative, it is natural in children to want to learn, but not if learning feels punitive. And I think that's often what we see. Um. Yeah, well, I'm um, uh, a not, not naturally optimistic. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm uh, most of, more of a pessimist uh, for people who know me. But um, I, I will say that I think, I think there's reason to hope. Um, you know, American education trends are, are uh, very faddish and, and change very rapidly. Um, and I, I really see that... Um, with um, the, the new reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, some, some real possibilities for change. Um, I think there, uh, some, some, um, uh, th there is more, uh, less of an emphasis on testing. Um, I think there is uh, um, more concern with what is called social and emotional learning there is more concern with um, the uh, sort of a broader view of education in the schools. So there, there is a policy context that has been set. And of course, I think it's large, it is a large reaction to the No Child Left Behind and, and, and the whatever, the last 16 years, if you will, or even more. Um, so I think there are some possibities. The, the downside of ESSA 
is that um, much more of authority over education um, is, is now in the states and a lesser role for the federal government. And the federal government has always had the role of, um, what shall I say, protecting the rights of children and also leveling the playing field for children. So that's, um, I think, a real worry. Um, you know, I, th I think there are definitely risks of push, what people call push down of the, um, um, le let's say, the stereotypical view of, of um, elementary education or K to five or K to three education. Um, but I think it's really, um, there are some possibilities for change. Um, I think in the next few years or, or, or decades. And I think it's really, um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, what we have done thus far, what Nicole has described, hasn't really led to any change. So, you know, the flat line, what we call the flat line, is clearly there. So we had all the, you know, all this stuff happening. And, and of course, populations change and so forth. But, you know, we aren't really doing meaningfully better in terms of our, you know, whatever, whatever we measure. So, um, so I think there is a sense that, um, uh, um, certainly among some circles, that we need to do something different. And I also would like to think that um, more knowledge about the capacities of young children and children themselves um, to learn given the appropriate learning opportunities, uh, which I describe in my book, um, is has been shown to and can lead to much better achievement and learning among children. So I, I think it's really all up, up to us to try to make sure that um, all of these um, changes that we have the policy context to operate under and using the knowledge we have um, that we can improve the educational conditions for children. And the last thing I will say because of Dana's book um, on the teacher wars is that a really key part of this is really the transformation of our educator preparation system. That's what I was about to ask you about. Um, so we know from the research what type of teaching works with young children. Of course, it's play-based, and the teacher really needs to be a wonderful observer of children's interactions with one another and be able to stimulate the kind of conversation that leads to learning. It's challenging to retrain and, and train up all of the many, many educators that we're going to need to do this work in the coming years, you have some great stats in the book. This is a 90% female workforce, and they're making, on average, only 80% as much as a kindergarten teacher makes. So as we know more and more about what a sophisticated thinker you need to be to teach three and four-year-olds, we still have not, I mean, come nearly to the point of catching up on the educational qualifications we expect for folks doing this work or the pay. So what do you see as the path forward uh, Ruby for teachers and teacher training and preparation and, and funding of that really crucial work? Um, well, I devote a chapter in my book to um, who, the, who the educators should be and what kinds of people they should be. I think I would say, except in spots or throughout the country, um, most teacher preparation programs um, are not preparing the kinds of teachers that we're talking, or as you described, just described, um, uh, Dana. And um, so, really, it's 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 the I think it's the responsibility of the of uh, what shall I say of our society to really de demand certain kinds of teachers. Um, and and because teachers are developed in state by state. Um, to make sure that um, our state uh, uh, commissions and credentialing agencies um, are, are, are specifying and, 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 and uh, um, uh, what shall I say, in, uh, having uh, institutions of higher education train different kinds of teachers. Um, I, 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 you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge predicament. I, I don't have, you know, any easy answers. I know that there are places that are doing this. 
um, but they're just too far and few in between. The other thing I would like to say is that I tried very hard to to sort of keep to the American situation and not to do very much international comparisons, even though that's really one of my <laughs> my passions and loves. Um, because, you know, uh, I'm reminded that, that Americans don't like to be told that, that other places are doing it, uh, uh, you know, differently and so forth because, you know, we do it our way in, in America. Uh, I think that's very true, but I think it's very important to look to international um, um, examples of how teachers are selected. Um, in many countries, it's very well documented. In many countries that at least do very well internationally, um, most of the people who want to become teachers never get to become teachers. They are selected um, for teacher training. They have um, a very different kind of teacher training. Um, they are um, very well respected in their countries. Um, they're relatively well compensated. In some countries, they're well compensated according to other professionals in their country. So this is a, we, we need to at least pay some attention to what's happening in other countries. And I will finally say one of the things that, I don't know if it's still available, but John Merrow maybe in the 90s did a comparison of the training of early educators in the United States and in France. And if you watch that 45-minute that video, I think you will see that the kinds of teachers that are prepared in the United States and France, particularly for young children, are, are so significantly different. And um, um, I think it really affects the education of children. I mean, I think I think I think a lot about international comparisons too, and also along the lines that Nicole opened us up with. I do feel that our racial diversity here sometimes is what sets us apart from other nations in terms of the lack of public consensus on spending on other people's kids. To circle us back to where we started, I mean, as we see European nations diversify, their social welfare states also become more controversial as we're seeing um, in places like Denmark, say, where there's you know, a right-wing populist movement against some of the benefits that, say, refugees are able to access when they come to that society. So I guess I'll start with Nicole. You know, where do you see this conversation politically going on equity and universality of things like childcare, early education, just quality in general, and I, I will end with politics, and we'll go back to it, but this is something that Hillary Clinton is talking about a lot, so I'm curious as to how each of you are hearing what she's saying. I mean, I've, I've actually been, I don't know if I, I wouldn't say surprised, not a lot surprises me, but um, I guess disturbed by how little public education has actually been part of the conversation um, during the, the election. I think it speaks to a lot to how Americans see public education. I, I fear as, as the country is becoming more brown, as public school students are becoming more poor, as we're seeing um, one demographic shifts so of smaller numbers of white children being born, but also an increasing white withdrawal from the public system that in many ways public schools are, are, are starting to be seen the way of other public institutions for instance, like public hospitals, um, where this is just the realm of the poor or people who don't have choice and it's not something that we're really talking about. Um, so I think that there's been um, an astoundingly little amount of discussion um, about public education, supporting public education, um, and even, I actually haven't been that impressed with what Hillary Clinton has been saying about it. I think, I think that we are at a place where we do not value public schools because we don't think public schools are going to be for white children that much longer. And I think you, the conversation is very different in um, cities where most kids are white than in cities where most kids are not white. Right. I mean, we still have 90% of American kids in public schools, right? So, I don't know. That's a really depressing thought. I don't know. Yeah, but if you but when you look demographically at the shift in in public schools, right, where public schools are not reflecting the the makeup of our nation, and yes, we have 
an overwhelming percentage of kids in public schools, but white kids are still the most segregated group of kids in the country. We're talking very differently about public schools in those communities than we are nationally. And I think when we're talking about um, on the national stage, of course, the community conversation is very different. And the community conversation is reflecting the racial makeup of uh, schools that tend to be either very white or very black and Latino. I think on the national stage, though, there is a sense that our country is changing. We know that. Um, the majority of kids being born are now black and Latino. And I think that that necessarily means that we are talking less about public education because and, of that. And I think it was just last year that the population of school children flipped, right, to be a minority majority. Though you can't really say that children of color are a minority anymore because they're not. Um, so Ruby, what have you been hearing? I understand that this presidential debate is like not the place to go for substance, but we do, <laughs> we do have Hillary Clinton saying that pre-K will be a priority for her. And she's also talking about childcare for even younger children. Um, in your book, you talk about targeting childcare from birth to age three at the neediest kids, sort of distinct from your argument actually for universality for the older ones. For the younger ones, you're interested in more of a targeted approach. Hillary is actually not suggesting that. She's offering what she calls a, you know, a cap, a cap for every single family in the US where you would never spend more than 10% of your income on childcare. So how are you hearing these different, po this swirl of policy ideas coming from her campaign. Right, I mean, these are very complicated matters. Microphone. And, you know, and policy, policy details matter and, um, and, and certainly in implementation. Um, I, I, I think I would say that, um, uh, first of all, you know, we, I think we do need to make a distinction um, or try to think about whether there are any differences uh, between childcare and um, what I would call pre-K or early education. Um, th that's a very controversial statement, even within the field. But um, to just just um, sort of go further on this, uh, as Dana said in my book, basically what I say in the American context and being totally a pragmatist or tr trying to be a pragmatist um, that um, from birth to three, um, our federal dollars uh, should be spent on, on children who, who are vulnerable or who are at risk for, uh, uh, for poor outcomes or who lack the opportunities and the resources uh, based on their family income um, to, to really have the opportunities to develop their um, talent and potential. Um, but that um, our public education systems should start at three years of age as, as universal voluntary education with kindergarten at five years of age being compulsory. So that's basically what I lay out. Um, I think the reason why, reason we don't hear very much in the debates about education and this um, presidential, um, what shall I say, season, is no different from many, many of the other presidential seasons where education is barely mentioned. Um, right now, education is not part of the federal constitution. So they are um, actually efforts um, to try to think about whether there should be a federal constitutional right to education. Um, states really ha are have in their constitutions uh, what they define as basic rights to education. And what I suggest in my book, recognizing the state's authority of education as part of our American, American education system, that one of the things we should do is to engage in legal strategies and litigation in the states around redefining basic rights to education, including changing um, the, the age at which public responsibility for children's education um, w would begin. Because it's really right now in the states. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think that's you know, something I, I think a lot of people have not written about or, or pursued and I, I really put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, the final thing I will say here, Dana, is that you know, um, um, the president 
and, and in, in the presidential campaign here, there have been mentions of, of pre-K or preschool or childcare and so forth. The fact of the matter is that we don't have the resources now to serve most, the majority of children in these programs that we all have in place. Um, so what I also try to address in my book is that people who want to have these programs for children have to engage in battles around tax and budgetary reform because unless we are able to generate the revenues in fairly large numbers to support the things that are being proposed, they're basically kind of pie in the sky. Um, the last question I have for you both before we open it up to questions is you introduce a really great idea in the book, Ruby, which is um, the, the moral case for doing the right thing in education versus the economic case. And I have thought about this a lot as someone who, like Nicole, for a decade has been writing about public schools. We hear the economic case constantly, 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 that if we can raise student test scores, we're going to see students earn 1% more you know, when they're 23, which is the difference of $500 a year or something. So it's like not a life-changing difference. Some of these studies that have come out that show this test score income link. Um, how do we shift the conversation to a moral conversation? This is one of the reasons why I think Nicole's work has struck such a chord on This American Life and in the Times Magazine is that she brings us to the sort of ethical, moral core of these questions about where we send our own children to school and what, how we behave and, and what we do. So I would ask both of you to reflect on, on shifting from this narrow reason for why we want to do the right thing to a broader, broader conversation about, as you say, Ruby, what children have the right to. Can you start? Okay. Um, so I think that when you look at, when you just think about the, the words public education and what that is supposed to mean. And public education is not supposed to mean that I can secure an advantage and I can secure access into a publicly funded school that operates like a private school. The notion of public education, at least the way that Americans like to, what we like to tell ourselves and our belief is that this is in fact the great equalizer, that this is the place where it doesn't matter where you start out in life, you can come into these doors and the masses would be the one place in American life where the masses mix and intermingle and where if you work hard, you can escape your lot in life. We know that that's not true. We know that what public schools do is um, they either replicate your disadvantage or they replicate your advantage. And I've been thinking about this for a long time when I first started reporting on school segregation. And I went back and I read Brown v. Board of Education and I realized that Never once in Brown v. Board do they mention test scores, do they mention achievement. That's not in that, in that ruling. That ruling is about access to citizenship. That ruling is about being able to be a full American and recognize your full potential as an American. And so this focus on, I mean, of course it's important that children achieve. It's, of course it's important that we are able to measure that children are actually learning in school. It's actually the, but the focus on testing is the wrong focus. The focus on schools as, as a place where one can um, get access, you know, score a certain level on a test and get into Harvard is not actually what public schools are supposed to be about. Public schools are supposed to be about um, grooming citizens. They're supposed to be about giving children the ability to think, about giving children the ability to escape their lot in life um, and to understand their neighbors and their role in this country. And so when we've got a system that is only based on securing the advantage for your child, I think that is antithetical to the notion of public schools. And it has become really hard to say, so, so when I talk and what I wrote in my, in my magazine pieces, I actually don't believe my daughter deserves more than other kids. And that is a hard thing to say in modern day America because there is a lot of pressure starting when I first moved to the city with my daughter as a one-year-old, when people are like, you need to figure out what you're gonna do about your daughter's schooling. When you start getting test prep notices in the mail and the email when your daughter is three so you can test prep her for talented and gifted as a four-year-old, you realize that the system has gotten very corrupt. Our understanding of public education, not that it was ever perfect, and I'm not a racial, I'm not an optimist at all. 
Uh, I'm a pragmatist, I study history. It's not that we ever had a public education system that was fair. Um, but I think we have lost kind of the moral charge when it comes to the belief in public schools. I think in a place like New York City, um, and, and a lot of places where middle class progressive people love the notion of saying, I'm in a public school. But that public school is not a public school that looks like most of the public schools in the city. That public school is a public school where you're saving $25,000 a year because you have a school where every other kid in your, in your daughter's class is rich and has connections. And so you're not, you're not making any sacrifice to go to this public school. And I think that we, um, I don't know how we get that moral charge back um, when we're seeing the increasing privatization of public schools, when we have under the notion of school choice, which ostensibly is supposed to be a great equalizer because anyone can go to any school, but we know what choice really does is, is helps the privileged gain advantage. I don't know how we get that moral charge back. And I think what my writing is trying to do, I, I never believe that any of the work that I do is gonna change anything. Uh, I think I deal with issues that are so deeply entrenched. But what I what I am saying with my work is that I'm not going to let us pretend that it's other than what it is. Um, I'm not going to let us ignore that um, we have great disadvantage within our public school system. I don't understand how we allow a system within the same school district um, where some schools have virtually no poverty and every resource and PTA can raise a million dollars. And other schools are like my daughter's schools where in a good year we can raise $2,000 at our PTA where every single child in that school is poor. Um, as long as we continue to allow that and convince ourselves that we can just throw some money at those poor schools and they'll be okay, then I, I think we have completely lost our moral obligation in public schools. And I think we should stop getting bragging rights about enrolling our kids in those types of schools. Yeah, I, I agree that, um, you know, the mythology of education as the great equalizer in American society is not supported by the facts. Um, social mobility in the United States is even lower than Britain, for example. Um, and so, um, you know, you, you, you realize um, it, it, we, we're not a society that is, is uh, living the American dream. I mean, what I tried to do in my book quite carefully is that um, although I think we should strive for um, closing the divide for, for education uh, equality, um, it does not lead to income equality. Um, that's a fact. Um, it helps. It definitely helps. If you don't have education, you don't have a chance, even though your chance is small. Um, and income inequality, to go back to some of the issues that um, Nicole has addressed, income inequality does not lead to racial equality. And that, is a, that it remains um, an American dilemma. And um, so, you know, I actually was in a conversation <laughs> this past weekend about these issues. And, you know, the way it ended up was we should give up on the schools. Um, I think that, um, you know, and I came away with this, this idea. Um, you know, schools do matter. They matter a bit. And I would say they can matter more than they matter now. And so, you know, we, we just have some, I think, some choices and decisions to make uh, about the shape of American education in the kind of society that we know where we are in or, or moving toward. Um, one of the reasons why I kind of like, uh, what shall I say, stick with this is these issues is that I really am very concerned about what will happen if we accept the current situation um, as you know, has been described, what kind of society um, our children and their children will live in. I, I, I don't want to feel that I gave up and did not try to contribute to at least stopping that or, at le or trying to make um, um, our society live to its ideals. I could just, there's, there's, I guess two things I'd, I'd like to add. Um, one thing that I always think about, so, those of you who know my, know my story have heard my 
work, I've, um, I was bust. I was bust out of um, segregated poor school into all white uh, wealthy schools. And I always keep in mind that I was the kid that parents didn't want in their school. And I think I've done pretty damn good for myself. So I think we need to, we need to think about, I think what we don't acknowledge is the, the loss of potential of all of these children who are deserving of a quality education and are receiving them. In my This American Life piece, um, Mario's mother, Nidra, what she says is, how dare you deny my daughter because she could be the doctor who saves your life one day or the lawyer who gets your kid out of jail one day. I don't think we think enough about all of these children. And it was one thing when our nation was 75 or 80% white to squander the potential of a small segment of the population. But when you have a country that very quickly is going to be, or half of children are black and Latino, to continue to squander the potential of those children is going to be to the detriment of our entire nation. I understand that we are not, as Americans, very altruistic. We want to do things that are going to benefit us as individuals and not as a society. And so my my argument is that we will continue to squander these children's future at our own peril. And while we could contain that when it was a small percentage of the population, we are not going to be able to contain the harm of, of not allowing these children um, who could be you know, the next, the innovators of what our future is going to have to pay our social security, all of these things. So I, I think if nothing else, if we don't care about these kids just because they're children and we should care about them, we should care about them because it's going to come to our doorstep sooner or later. Thank you. Okay, so let's open up to questions and please keep your question brief and a question, not a comment. Um, okay, in the back. Hi, I'm a former early childhood teacher, actually trained at Bank Street. I now work in higher education and workforce development. And it seems to me that all the employers I talk to are complaining that they don't have soft skills. That's what they're missing in their employees. And it seems to me that the argument is that we've stopped teaching soft skills. Is there a space for us to get together with early childhood advocates, higher education people, and workforce development people to come up with a societal argument about why we need to be going up instead of bringing achievement down? Yes, I think the first step we need to do is to stop calling it soft skills. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I think terms are really important. I think in my book I try to say core skills or fundamental skills or something like that. I can't even remember, but not so, I never use the word soft skills. Um, you know, I, th I think there, there is, right now, I can't tell you how long it will last, but right now, uh, I, I see an ascendance of interest in those skills, um, um, uh, not only in the workplace, but also in schools. Um, the, the problem, I will say, is that we are not preparing our educators in general um, to, to support the development of those core skills. So, um, um, you know, I think we, we, we need to rethink where, what, what we're doing in our educator preparation programs. But again, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Okay, gentlemen in the back, you have the mic. Uh, hi, yeah, so uh, my name is Will. Um, I'm wondering, so whenever, I hear these conversations about you know a flawed education system. Usually, they always mean um, formal schooling. Um, and even tonight, we're talking a lot about formal schooling. So I'm thinking, you know, formal schooling might be part, definitely a big part of the puzzle. But are we limiting our focus too much on formal schooling as opposed to perhaps you know the other parts of the puzzle? Well, I think. Um I'm not sure exactly what you mean by informal schooling, but it... Well, okay, so I guess I'll give an example. So um, part of our success, right, is necess not necessarily always because of where we went to elementary school or high school. Uh, for example, Warren Buffett, um, when he, he would go to the library and he would read all the finance books at least twice. And that's how he learned, you know, how to be successful in that particular field. Hmm. Okay, does anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that my work focuses on what the government can control, and the government can control public education. The government can't control whether a kid can go, is gonna wanna go to the library and read finance books or whether a kid has good parents or not. Um, 
I say I don't even, we can't even get to the point of whether the difference is parenting or what happens in the home because we've never actually offered an equal playing ground within the realm of what the government control, control which is public schools. So if, if we were offering all kids access to equal education, then maybe I would worry about informal schooling and parenting. But what I can say is if you have um, kids who are going in schools that are actually widening the achievement gap, and what we know is that uh, a child who starts school in kindergarten, a black child, a black low-income child who starts school in a segregated kindergarten already has a gap, and five years later, that gap has increased. So instead of closing the gaps, public schools are actually widening the gaps. Um, it's hard to go into the library and read finance books if you can't read. And so I, I think that that, I don't even know that you can have that discussion um, outside of understanding that our public schools are actually not even educating children to read. And they're often, those children who are in those schools have come from parents who are also undereducated and miseducated in the public schools and who also um, are functionally literate. Um, and they came from parent, grand, parents who were also undereducated in those schools. So I just don't think we can, we can have that conversation until we've actually provided quality education for all children. I, I'd like to address the informal education part. I think it's really important. Um, they are public libraries. Um, they are um, ways um, uh, in which nonprofit and voluntary associations um, provide all kinds of child and youth development programs. Um, there are differences in, in informal education depending on the resources of families. Families may find themselves in neighborhoods where they are not the kinds of informal um, uh, sites or resources for their children's education. And so, um, I, you know, children go to school maybe six, maybe eight hours and 180 80 days a year. So, so I would say informal education is really important. And it's important, and it's been very well documented, that you know, certainly based on family economic resources, uh, uh, you know, children whose, whose families do not have as much in terms of particularly the financial resources have less access to these informal um, sources of education, if you will, or learning, whereas wealthier families or more affluent families kind of pile up these informal education opportunities on their children and is considered to be a reason for the, the, the gap or, or the divide in children's education. So I think it's very important. Okay, I don't know where the mic is. Oh, it's back here. Hi, uh, my name is Kelly. I'm a parent at a public school in Brooklyn in District 17 that actually happens to through a variety of factors, kind of a perfect storm of factors, be very integrated at the moment. And the thing that we are learning is that integrated communities need support. Um, and as we work on that, I'm wondering, my question is, can is there a way that we can think of public schools as actually being laboratories for integration, a very few of them, and maybe even vectors for change on a larger scale if we are able to get it right? I'm trying to be optimistic in the midst of pessimism, you know, knowing that it's hard, if we are having some success, and there's a panel Wednesday morning at the New School on integration success stories, I'll be very interested to see what exactly we talk about at that panel, because it's tough. But if we get it right there, can it not then amplify? Isn't it even more important, kind of, to fix it there and then take that out into the rest of society? Yeah, I mean, one, we want it to be easy. Um, segregation did not come naturally. We put a tremendous amount of both social and governmental resources into creating segregation, and we somehow then expect that integration will be this easy thing. It's not going to be easy. Um, so I expect that it is and it always will be hard, and we're always gonna have to work really hard at it because equity is something you have to work really hard at. But what the what the, the data shows, and there have been, particularly I'm thinking of Rucker Johnson out of Berkeley, longitudinal studies that have looked at the long-term impacts of integration. And for black and white children, it can be transformative. It's not just a matter of kids sitting in a classroom together. There's nothing magical about white kids that make black kids smarter, as much as we may believe that. Um, but what it shows is that when black kids and 
get access to integrated education, it does change the entire trajectory of their lives. They're less likely to live in poverty. They're more likely to go to college. They're less likely to go to jail. They live longer. They live health, they're healthier. They're more likely to live in integrated neighborhoods. And the same is also true of white children. Uh, white children who go to integrated schools are more likely than to live in integrated neighborhoods themselves and to choose integrated schools for their own children. So we know that if we can do this very hard thing in the schools, and, and the schools are having to do a lot, right? The schools are having to deal with housing segregation. They're having to deal with larger systems of inequality, and we're all trying to fix this within the classroom. But the schools are also kind of like the single largest um, area that the government controls. So if there's one place that we can do it, this is the place, but it's very hard. Um, so I think that, yeah, there are success stories. I mean, me being the pessimist, even the success stories aren't usually that great, uh, but they're certainly better than the alternative. But I think if, if we are committed to equality, then we have to be committed to actually making these very difficult circumstances work, and it will pay dividends down the road. This is why I say it's important to understand that um, integration, that school equality is not about test scores. It just isn't. It really is about building citizens and it's about getting access to full citizenship, particularly for black and Latinos, right? It's about justice. It's not about diversity or something that feels good. Um, but it's, it's certainly worth working on and it should be hard. That's great. I also like to mention, though, that there is a new federal study out that shows that white children's test scores are the same in schools with high percentages of black students as in schools with no black students. So I, this is something I talk about a lot when I go all over the country to, to talk about these issues because a lot there are so many misconceptions that if you are a white or an upper middle class college educated parent, you're doing something bad to your child by sending them to a school with low income kids. And, and that is just not true from research. Right. I mean, this is why I, one of the reasons I could make the decision I made for my daughter is understanding the research and my daughter will be fine no matter where I put her. The problem is when it comes to race, logic does not apply, right? So when it comes to race, I can cite as many studies going all the way back. You can look at the achievement gap um, and test scores if you look at national education statistics. At the peak of desegregation, white test scores are continuously going up as black test scores are going up, as our classrooms are becoming more integrated. But again, logic, we're, not, we're not talking about logic here because if it was logic, people wouldn't be afraid to put a five-year-old in a school with black five-year-olds. That's not logical. So I think that's where we always run into it is there is, this, there is a fear. Um, and all the data in the world is not going to make that fear go away. So, so my name is Christian, and I'm a, a product of American, British, Swedish, and French public education. So, and I'm surprised that nobody said, nobody used the word capitalism yet. So I, I think that racism is a function of capitalism, uh, and I think that a lot of the problems we're facing today is a function of late-stage capitalism. So how do we repackage our desire for universal education, uh, universal desegregated education, in that context. Maybe Ruby can address this because one of the things you do talk about in the book is with our current corporate and high income tax rates, we are just not going to be able to do the things that, that we want to do and that you suggest. Yeah, I mean, basically, um, you know, I would say that um, we need to change the way in which we tax individuals and corporations and businesses in American society. Um, it's not only a fairness issue, but I think it's also a revenue issue. And we are not going to be able to do all the things that we want to do. Any, any of the things we talked about or any of the things we hope for without that particular change. I mean, you know, and I try to, in my book, show you know, the, the number crunching that, that goes into kind of supporting uh, the, this kind of um, argument. So, yeah, definitely um, uh, there needs to be, you know, basic changes in tax, tax budget policies in the United States. Uh, let's take one more question from Susan up here. Hi, I'm Susan Oxhorn, and this has been a great conversation. And Nicole, you used the metaphor, which is the title of my book, Squandering America's Future. And it was really just beautiful. Um, my question to you is, we have the one of the 
the second highest poverty rate in among developed nations, child poverty rate. And we can talk from here until forever about changing our schools. But as Larry Cuban and um, David Tyak said from Stanford, historians, education historians, you know, we're kind of tinkering toward utopia. What do we, in that, you know, our education reform, the aspirations that we have for education, which, you know, are not, are not, you know, we're not reaching the goal. So how do we approach this issue of poverty, which is, you know, we know is probably the key factor, I mean, along with institutional racism in children's academic achievement? Damn. Um. <laughs> uh, one, I mean, one thing I think, one thing I think about a lot in terms of why our poverty and inequality conversation has focused so heavily on education is that it doesn't force us to give stuff to the adults that we have always thought of as undeserving. You know, especially to low-income single mothers of color who have just been. Um, victimized again and again in our public debate when in fact they are working, almost all of them, often more than one job. They're you know, some of the hardest working people in our society. And yet when we talk about bigger fixes for poverty, like whether it be say a child payment that every baby born would go to their, to their, to their mother, that gets us into very dicey territory politically. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can't um, disentangle why we have the second highest child poverty rate in race, clearly, right? Those, there's a reason for that. And that is also the reason why we don't invest in certain social programs that all of these other countries that have a safety net invest in. And you can look at the history of um, almost every social policy that we passed, particularly in the last century, race was right in the center of that who we would and would not support, what these programs would look like, were all driven by a fear that poor black people would be getting something that they don't deserve. I don't know, you know, there's a reason, <laughs> my Twitter bio says I cover race from 1619, because I say that everything goes back to that first decision to enslave black people on the soil in this country in 1619. And it's not being hyperbolic, it has driven everything in this country. Um, and, and so whenever people are like, how do we fix something? How do you go back and fix that? How do you, we can't. I mean, the answer I can't even say on the record, which, are we recording this? It's revolution, right? Like you have to, <laughs> you, I mean, you literally have to start, you have to start from scratch. There's not, there's nothing that race does not touch and corrupt in this country. And everything is driven by that, even when we think that it's not, um, I mean, that's what I'm talking about when I say from the, you know, the founding of public education in this country was to create schools that were not going to equally educate black and white children. That were going to prepare black and white children for very different futures. And that is what we're continuing to do and we can't get past that. Ruby, would you like to have the last word on where the poverty debate fits into the primary education debate? Yeah, um, it's not the last word. Hopefully it's the continuing <laughs> word. Um, you know, I, in, in my book, I devote a chapter to investing in families. Um, you know, I, be, because I, I do believe that, um, you know, the school can do much more than it does, but it can't do the job alone. And particularly for young families, the, um, um, the educational level, the literacy, the economic power of families is really important. And so one of the things I argue for in the new primary school is the connection uh, to family workforce development, for example. Um, and there, there are some really interesting efforts um, in, that, in that regard. And um, so, you know, I, I would also like to say that um, I, I recently was thinking about the war in poverty and the other America, and since I have a very good visual memory, um, you will recall that the photograph on Michael Harrington's The Other America is of white children. Um, that we started the war in poverty, really, if you accept the fact that Michael Harrington was a major factor in that, because of poverty in Appalachia. 
And, um, you know, in, in my interpretation, Nicole, of, of history um, in, in the 60s was that that became very much coincide, uh, came in connection with the civil rights movement. And, and so that's how I think some of the things that Nicole is saying about the association with poverty with, you know, African-American children and so forth um, 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 may have occurred over time and now what our image of poverty is. But let's remember that was one, one of them. And so I think, you know, I, I, I think what we need to do is to not give up on the schools, and I, I really think that sometimes when we have these conversations, there's a tendency to give up on the schools, and, and I think some of us are here because the schools did not renege on their responsibilities. So I think that's very, very important. But clearly, we're not here because we're well-educated. You know, there were a lot of other things, our families, um, good fortune and luck, mentors, a whole bunch of things that happened uh, that brought us, you know, in front of you. So um, I, I try to talk about this in my book so that I don't put, you know, education at the center of it. But at the same time, I really don't want us to give up on what I think the possibilities might be. Thank you so much to Ruby and Nicole. Thank you to all of you for coming.